to the Italian Football Podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to the Italian Football Podcast. I'm Carlo Garganese, joined as always by Nima Tavali. And on today's show, we will react to a very controversial weekend in Serie A, into our winter champions, but only after a highly contested winner and dramatic ending against Verona. Juventus remain two points behind after dramatic ending of their own as Dusan Vlaovic heads home in the 90th minute. Milan continued their recovery with a third win in a row against Empoli. Napoli's crisis goes from bad to worse as they are thrashed 3-0 by Torino and there are calls for Walter Mazzari to be sacked. The race for fourth place is as tight as ever as Fiorentina lose, Lazio win... Roma and Atalanta play out a fiery draw and Bologna draw. Um, so very, very tight in for the top four race. We also have Baggio, Prem Face and Serie Ass of the Week. For all of our first-time listeners, this is our free weekly episode that we do every Monday reviewing the weekend Serie A action and all the biggest talking points in Italian football. If you want to support the Italian Football Podcast and receive all of our content that we do throughout the week, including a weekly Q&A episode every Tuesday where we answer all the questions from our patrons, plus a, a weekly Thursday midweek review show, plus interviews, post-match reaction and much, much more, then go to Patreon dot com slash tifp and become a subscriber for just 2.99 a month plus vat you can also sign up to be a paid subscriber on spotify we'll provide the link in the description it's the same price same terms and for all of you who listen on spotify apple and itunes podcasts we'd really appreciate if you give us a five star rating give us a follow and a like we're also on youtube as well and um, all of that really helps us to grow and do more quality content for you guys Okay, so there's only one place to start, and that is Inter against Verona. Okay, so take two. I, I should just say <laughs> before we start that um, we already recorded all of this. In fact, we did 45 minutes yeah. of recording this morning, and if I say so myself, it was <laughs> it was absolute popcorn stuff. It was it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Me and Nima were discussing the 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 whole. Uh, Bastoni controversy and all the other incidents in that game, and then of course um, Juventus and 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 uh, and and everything that, that, that lots of stuff basically. Uh, you, you, you can probably imagine you've heard me and them debate yeah, in the past. Say, I think they <laughs> listen to us go. And I think they can imagine. It was brilliant, and it was it was totally natural, uh, mm. and and it unfortunately was, it was fantastic. Oh, and I'm absolutely gutted that, that we lost it. Um, not because, I would have loved to listen. One to because I'm, I'm really busy today, and I don't really have time to record again uh, but we've managed to fit in some more time to, to record this again so um i don't think it can live up to uh no. to, to, to what it was about that. But, but let's see let's see maybe, <laughs> yeah, exactly. maybe it will maybe it will i mean we've already started off in too much of a good mood for it to be, to be, to be as it was but let me see if i can uh, if i can uh do a bit of sanitary and, 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 and trigger Nimmo into, into, into and likewise, I'm sure Nimmo will do the same to me. Um, okay, right. Let's start off then with 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 the, the incident that everyone's talking about. So the Bastani incident. Um, so um, Inter beat Verona 2-1. Um, it comes after an uh, uh, injury time winner from Davide Fratesi, who turns the ball in from, from close range. Af- but only after an incident in which Alessandro Bastani strikes i know nima is gonna get uh, that word. Stri- uh, no he shot him he killed him yeah <laughs> and Al- Al- alessandro bastoni strikes or shoulder charges as nima's gonna call it yeah, andres Andre duda uh off the ball um it's not given by the referee the var doesn't bring it back either um and as i said fratesi scores after the game all hell breaks loose and it's become a big a big debate a big controversy um which and we'll go into lots of other offshoots of this. Um, but first of all, let's get straight to the point. I asked you this when we first recorded Nilla. Mm-hmm. Do you think that do you think that this was a was a foul? If Michael Fabri, who is standing there, if you look at the replay, you see that the referee Michael Fabri is standing there by the situation and sees this very closely. He's actually very well positioned for the situation. If Michael Fabri had blown his whistle and given a free kick to Hellas Verona in that situation, I wouldn't have had any problems with it whatsoever because that's the kind of thing that you see million times in games. Sometimes the referee gives it, sometimes the referee doesn't. So there's no discussion there. For me, it's you can give it, you, can, you, you can't give it. But for the VAR, and this is what has been really pissing me off, to blow this up the way that it has in Italian media... 
turning, first of all, sh- showcasing a remarkable lack of under- knowledge of the human anatomy, not understanding the difference between an elbow and a shoulder, which is in and of itself fantastic. Then trying to make this into the greatest refereeing scandal since, you know, as we say in Gothenburg, since Jesus went and walked down the street in shorts, <laughs> it's is is utterly bizarre. Uh, it's 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 not a refereeing scandal. What it is is given, in fact, given how the referee, the VAR, and the referee, the level they kept in this game, it's actually consistent. Because Marka Arnautovic was fouled from behind, leading up to Hellas Verona's equalizer. The VAR looked at it, saw nothing. And because the referee saw it, and it's not a clear and obvious error, neither is this. This is where this is where, where I get really annoyed. It's the way that they are trying to change the protocol of VAR and how it's applied mid-season. You don't get to do that. Match day one to match day 38. Before match day one is when you need to get your shit together, your ducks in order, and tell everyone this is the level we're keeping. You don't get to change the VAR protocol's application on match day 19. You don't get to do that. This is not a clear and obvious error. The referee was literally there. He saw everything that happened. He adjudged it to not have been a, a foul, and he, just like he did it with the, with the Arnautovic situation. And so... They, they didn't give it. One in favor of Inter, one against Inter. And that's not even that's without even getting into the ridiculous penalty. I don't think I've ever seen in my life a player receive a tap on the sole of his foot and not fall down, but put that very foot down, take one and a half step with that foot, then fall down, and then the VAR step in and gives a penalty. I mean, that is, that's ridiculous. If, if you want to, if, uh, if he had dived from the initial contact and fallen down, penalty all day long. But of course, but it's not. It's not. He puts his foot down, takes a step and a half, and then fall. Remember, shit. He kicked me. I got to fall down. It's it's. It was embarrassing refereeing, and 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 the way that this has been treated and hyped up in the media with our dear friends in Tutto Sport calling it Campione di Inverno, which is hilarious coming from that that ket, <laughs> the, the, that kettle calling the pot pot black, um, is 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 jokes because when their team. And let's be honest, Tutto Sport is Juventus' unofficial PR mouthpiece. In the opening stage, uh, match day one against Bologna, when Bologna, when the VR didn't intervene and give Juve a penalty, there was no VAR puns then. And and this is and the rest of them, the Gazetta especially, with their with started all of this with the elbow nonsense, and it's been going on since then, and it's just ridiculous because it just puts it creates. You know, if you're going to create that narrative, there's going to be pushback, and I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. You want to? You, let's play. Let's all have fun. Let's let's have a shit show for the next six months. I'm perfectly okay with that. But don't give me this bullshit about Bastoni's uh, shoulder magically turning into his elbow, and this being this unbelievable injustice. Uh, not buying it. Not buying it. Again, like, yeah. again. If Fabri had given it, I wouldn't have said anything. But if Fabri, but for the VAR to intervene there, just like Fabri with the Arnautovic equalizer, you have to be consistent in at least in the same game. That's not too much to ask. Yeah. Okay. Well, the way I look at this is 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 very simple, and I just wish everyone would would, would look at it simply. And that is the Bastoni incident. It's a clear foul. Is 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 you say? Uh, and, and let me finish. You you say you know. It's more of a 50-50 million times in a game. You know, sometimes it's given, sometimes it, it doesn't, you know, shoulder to shoulder and all this. For me, look, that incident, it's a clear foul. Um, I think all the referees that have spoken after the game have said it's, it's, it's a foul. Um, the zone said it, Sky Sport Italia, Sport Media set, Rai all said it, it's a foul. Referee chief Jevasoni said it's a foul. They've, they've suspended uh, the, the refs. Uh, the, the VAR official has been demoted to, to, to Serie B. Um, so on that incident, I wish people would just be very simple about it and say, look, that was a foul. The, the goal should have been disallowed. S- that's it. Simple as that. Then we can talk about the other incidents one by one. We can look at the the, the, the Magnani uh, challenge on Arnautovic before the equaliser for, for Verona at 1-1. And yes, for me, it's more of a foul than a foul. 
I disagree with the whole comparison, comparing it to Bastoni because they're completely different incidents. One is challenging for the ball. One is completely off the ball completely. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter if one's more than a foul than the other. If they're a foul, they're a foul. But, you know, there can't be comparisons in terms of the severity of the two. Not not at all. The penalty at the end is a penalty. There's clear contact. It's, it's And again, the referees have said it's a penalty. But, yes, he's certainly if you want to call it simulated, he certainly exaggerated it and he certainly delayed his fall. There's no doubt about that. But we see that all the time um, with, with with penalties and that isn't a marker for deciding whether it's a penalty or not. The marker is, did was there was there contact? No, was well, the contact the worthy of a foul? It was. Um, no, so- was it a foul or not? Just every contact yeah. is not a foul. That co- It can't be a foul when the contact doesn't initiate the player to fall down. He ta- he literally walks on that foot that has been that is the the victim of the contact for takes one and a half steps and then falls down afterwards. But so go, going going down ridiculous. doesn't decide going down doesn't decide whether whether it's a foul. I mean Stuart Pearce got headbutted by by Basil Bolly in the Euro ninety two <laughs> and he. That. And he stood there and watched it. That doesn't mean that Basil Bolly, that it's not a foul. And Basil Stuart, Bolly, you know, so Stuart they, Pierce's nickname was Psycho as well. So can, yeah. we, can, we, can we please not? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, if we want to go to extremes. But what, I tell you what, I just, I'm, what I'm fed up of, and I didn't even tweet about this after the game because I'm sick, and, and you know this, I'm sick and tired of, of, of debating that the, big, the bigger talking points around this, which is why when everybody was, was saying, oh, it's the Juventus League and Juventus owned the league, like, you know, even like last season, the two seasons ago, whenever some some decisions might have gone Juventus's way, you know. Might I'm, have. I'm fed. Might I'm, well, exactly. Have. See, this is the problem. This is this is the might problem. Have. This you is can't even problem. own that they went your way. It no, went your way. Just I'm say not. It. I'm talking hypothetically here. I'm, oh, okay. I'm talking, Fair hypothetically, enough. Fair I'm talking enough, hypothetically here. I'm, I, I I said the same things then as I'm saying now. I'm fed up of when people. One group of people say. The league is rigged because of this incident. The league is rigged for Inter. It's the Marotta League. Inter yeah. got all these decisions against Napoli. Inter got the the decision uh, for B Sex push against Genoa. Inter have had the have had the most penalties in the league this season. They've had the least yellow cards. I'm fed up when people are all saying this, right? And and but I'm equally fed up when the other side, the Inter side, is then saying there's this anti anti Inter narrative. Uh, I'm fed up of those who then do the whataboutism, and I know you're going to come back to this, Nima. Mm. I'm fed up of those who then do the whataboutism when discussing in, in each individual incident or the Bastoni incident, and are doing whataboutism about oh, and Gatti, Gatti did did, did this, did this, did this, did this punch, and uh, Bologna should have had a penalty uh, 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 against Juventus, deflecting on these incidents instead of just owning it and saying, you know what. Bastoni was a was a was a was a was a foul. You know, not trying to say maybe it was or it was. It's a clear foul. You know, I I I, I, of- I get to an extent. Just to finish, I get to an extent. This is fandom. I get that fans, not you, but fans are going to mm. be biased. Both Inter fans are going to be pro Inter. Some Juventus fans are going to be pro Juventus, and you know that's just 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 how it is. But I'm you know talking as somebody who you know. As a, as a, I don't really classify myself as a journalist, but somebody that's trying to be, uh, let's say, a little bit more objective than the usual, than your usual fan, and somebody that loves the Italian game, I'm just mm. fed up of how it goes to these extremes, and and I'm just fed up of it. I'm just fed up of it. I hate the deflection. Just be honest. Each individual incident was Bastonia foul, yes or no? Yes, it was. Was Bagnani on an out? Yes, yes, it was. See, I'm not even here. I'm not here here saying Inter robbed this game. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'm fed up of all the deflection and the and the, the, the oh there's a narrative and but, you well, know, there is a media narrative that's the point i'm making because in the age of var uh i i agree with everything you said there but my problem is this either everyone's guilty or no one's guilty narrative i'm a little bit sensitive to that after 17 years of calciopoli coverage having listened to nonsense so that's a little bit of a touchy subject for me that kind of oh either everyone's guilty or no one's guilty stuff i yeah i do react to that. that's a trigger point for me That is 100% true. So I do react to that. Yes. My issue is not, my issue is this, is not what fans do. I don't care what fans do. They can do whatever they want. Football, that's literally what a football fan is supposed to do, is to, is to react emotionally if they want to. If they don't want to, they don't. If they want to be rational. No, no one has the right to arbiter what football fans, how football fans react and support to their team and feel like that. That's fine. Leave it alone. I don't care about that. Right. I'm talking about this ridiculous narrative of blowing one situation up into the into this ginormous fake scandal and, and ignoring that in the age of VAR, I've watched 
Federico Gatti, a.k.a. the flyweight boxing champion of Serie A, box Milan Juric in the, in the chest, box Kvitsa Kvaratskhelia in the face, in the age of VAR, and get nothing for it. Nothing. In the age of VAR, I've watched him punch people, and he gets away with it, and I don't see these in uh, Campione d'Invarno on Tutto Sport or any other else, or any other front page. And that's the, na- that's the narrative I'm talking about. And yeah, see, I, I, dis- I, dis- I disagree with the narrative because see, I see those incidents certainly were blurred. The difference with those incidents is, and certainly, you know, I mean, I think, the, the, I mean, I've seen people, uh, I've seen on social media, everyone going mad about this Gatti one. And we'll come on to that game, uh, uh, Juventus against Seleni Turner, saying that, that Gatti should have been sent off. Uh, no, he uh, shouldn't have. Which absolutely is absolutely should, ridiculous. But then, but then I'm people saying, oh, you know, if, if Gatti... Uh, you know, if uh, if if Bastoni was a was a, was a foul, then 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 so was Gatti. I mean, these are the kind of ridiculous, it's know, not ridiculous. false equivalents that, that it's are not, it's just not ridiculous. False equiv- it's not a false equivalence the, because they're well, both it is, because one is a foul and the fouls. other one isn't. <laughs> both of them are fouls. That's the thing. Gatti's is definitely no, no, but a foul. that's not the argument. The argument is that Gatti should have been sent off. You know, no, the argument is if Bastoni should have been sent off, Gatti should be dragged to the to Nuremberg and shot in the head. That's, that's fine, talking. though. That's not the argument, though, with Bastoni. That the, is argument, the, argument. the argument with Bastoni is that, that the goal should have stood, you know? And then, I mean, you said yourself, it was a 50 50. It was a shoulder no, to shoulder. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, why I'm saying ed- that if Michael Fabri had blown his whistle in that situation and given a free kick, I would have nothing to say about it. It's the referee's call. It's more. I, I even think it's more of a foul than it isn't a foul. I'd say it's sixty forty a foul than it isn't. My issue is this narrative that is being pushed, creating this 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 ridiculous talking point. Because I because listen, here is the thing. I wasn't born yesterday. This is not my first interview Juve title race that I've seen, and I've seen how the Italian media handle it. Okay, I've seen this before. This is the classic, the script is this. Take 50-50 or 60-40, 70-30 calls in Inter's favor, blow them into this ginormous scandal, then a couple of weeks later, completely rat F Inter with a call that is so out of this galaxy so that when Inter complain and raise their voices, they say, see, what do you mean? It's 50-50, it happens to everybody. See, you got that controversial fake controversy call in your favor, so now you didn't. You know, ci può stare. And I'm and I'm tired of the cheapo star and nonsense. That's what yeah. I'm against. That's the narrative. They're laying the groundwork for rat effing Inter in the future because I've seen it happen. Yeah. So th- this is th- this is this is what I don't like. See what what you've just said. This is what because you're no. talking you're talking of hypotheticals there. No, I mean, I'm not talking about hypotheticals. I'm talking about, talking, about we're talking, you know, But what I'm talking about facts. What we've seen on the pitch with the incidents. You know. But I don't want to get involved in that. I don't want to get involved in those that are saying that you know Inter have had more penalties than anyone, and Inter have had all these these incidents that have gone their gone their way, and they're in credit. You know. I don't want to get involved in that. But if we are, what do want to get involved in that? We can say that those are facts that have happened. And you know you're talking about oh this is this is building so that the, the because that I've seen it get... happen in the past I've seen well, it happen yeah, in the past but then you have to acknowledge what's gone in their favour already uh, because of you know, that's that's facts but so, you can't tell me so, that so, but, you know but what I'm so what I'm saying is the false equivalency between a fifty fifty or a fifty five forty five situation and ballooning that up into being like the greatest scandal like when Juventus got were victim of that against Salernitana, that ridiculous goal when it was, uh, was it last season or the season before that? Last season, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. That, that is 100% a wrong call. Ballooning this to turn it into that, that's what I have a problem with. And that's what I don't like. And that is what they're doing. I mean, just look at the front pages of all three papers the day but after you can't, I'm sorry though, Nima. And Nima this morning. I mean, two this morning, two this... sport, of course, but Gazetta, you can't accuse Gazetta of being anti Inter. Anti Gazetta is as much pro Inter as, as two sport uh, is, is. No, it's pro- not. It's well, really not. It's owned by a guy who lives in Turin to begin with. The biggest, the biggest uh, uh, the minority shareholder is a guy named Urbano Cairo who lives yeah, in Turin. Torino, so, yeah. Yeah, Torino. Torino. Yeah, but come on, as if there come is on there, man. You can't, you can't the... tell me, you can't tell me that Gazetta are pro Juve. They are very anti Juve, and they have they're been, not pro. They have been throughout like their, their sport are. This is exactly the false equivalency I mean. That like the I'm Gazetta sorry. dello Sport <laughs> is as pro Inter as Tutto Sport is pro Juve. It's just ludicrously. I'm wrong. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to get into the whole Calciopoli stuff, but but mm. that is provably provably false by the coverage of Calciopoli. You know, whether even if it's true, even if you call it even if you call it all facts. 
that's mm. still provably by yeah, that's called journalism, Carlo. You know that you oh, cover the facts on, as they on, are, not as you on. wish them they, they would be. Come on, and, no, and I don't want to get into listen, I don't want to yeah. get into cow choppy. People yeah, that listen can make their own minds yeah, up on that, they but, absolutely but, can, but, especially but, given what happened on Sunday where the final appeal was thrown out. Emoji has to pay Inter 50,000 euros for their legal expenses. Okay, I said I'm not going to go there, but but I'm not going to go there. But listen, I just think just own each individual incident, don't start bringing in all this, all this other stuff of it's the morality. I think context matters. Narrative. I think context that- matters. And I think you have to be able to ask of the referees to help maintain one standard in at least the that's same That's fine. Game. That's that's fine. But take each game and each each incident and each game, each incident in each game and each game as a whole in in and just focus on that rather than doing all this, you know, from both sides. And I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm not taking anyone's. I haven't stand here and said that Inter robbed no. Uh, robbed, no, I know you robbed the game against game. Genoa. I didn't say they robbed the game against Napoli. In fact, I said in that game against Napoli that I I wasn't even sure about the Lautaro foul. If you remember, mm. yeah. I said, and you you were you were laughing at me, saying, "Oh, come on!" It's, you were it's actually saying Stonewall you were actually foul. saying it was a foul. I was saying it's I thought one of the clearest I was fouls saying I. Said. I, I was saying that the that. Ultimate, yeah. You see, I own that. When when a call goes in my team's favor, I, I don't want that. I don't want to win like that. I'm an interista. I've, my entire fandom has been around. I don't want to win with with the help of the referee. I don't like that. It, it feels dirty. I, I don't like that. That was a huge mistake, in my opinion, that went in into his favor. And I think the referee should own that. And I think they should that that, that he should be punished for that because that was a wrong call. You, you, there is never a situation on a football pitch where it's okay for you to to put both of your arms around the waist of your opponent. Never, ever is it is the, is there any time on a football pitch where that action is warranted. But but to but to create this the Bastoni situation. If you look at the entire situation, Duda puts his arms and and, and tries to hug Bastoni. Bastoni pushes him way, himself through it. That's when the ball is being played in. They obviously say some stupid things to each other. They both lose their temper. Um, Bastoni shoulder pushes him into his chest. He holds his face. The problem is that Michael Fabri's right there and sees this entire thing, sees the exaggeration, sees the simulation, says no, waves play on. And in that situation, it's not a clear and obvious error, and the VAR can't interv- intervene. But the push now is with Gervasoni and all this talking about VAR should intervene, and that was wrong, and, and the BSEC goal was wrong, and blah, blah, blah. Na, na, na. That is exactly intellectual prostitution that Mourinho spoke about in his famous Zero Titoli speech uh, in, in a similar situation. It's, a ma- it's manipulazione intellettuale, and, and, and that's all it is. And that's I don't I, want people to talk about the past stuff, the past instances. What I'm saying is exactly my point. Just talk about this game. Talk about the instances in this game at the end of the season. If we want to look at the end of the season and say, right, what decided the, the Scudetto race? Oh, maybe you know, maybe these. Oh, by then it's too late. That's fine. Well, that's, that's exactly yeah, it's, too, it. it's too late. But by then can, it's too late. It's too late. But we can look at it. You know, let's not. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just tiring. It really is. It's just tiring, mm. and, and, and I just wish people would just be honest and own it. Like, like you own that incident with with uh, with. Uh, the the, the, Lautaro. the the Lautaro one. For me, it's the know. same thing when Inter fans were complaining in the, in the derby the year that Milan won won the Scudetto when when Giroud and uh, tackled Alexis Sanchez before he scored the two one. There's no, that's not a foul. That's literally one big guy shoulder using his shoulder and his strength to win the ball off a smaller guy. It's not a foul. He didn't do anything wrong. Because it's it's not a foul. You're allowed. It's still a it's still a contact sport. For me, neither the Arnautovic situation nor the Bastoni thing is 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 a foul. I have no. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is where we disagree. I mean, I just it's it's a hundred percent of it. It's not sixty four. It's not seventy thirty. Nah, it's, it's, not, off the, it's off the ball. It's, not it's off the ball. It's off the ball. They're not challenging for the ball. So you can't. You cannot even. You cannot go. You with the shoulder to shoulder line when when you're not challenging for the ball. If you're challenging for the ball and you go shoulder to shoulder, you've got an argument. When you're away from the ball, off the ball, you're not challenging for the ball. Bastoni goes out of his way to you call it a shoulder charge, a strike, a shoulder, bit of a, a bit of a there's a little there's a little push. bit of a cock of the arm there as well. Yeah. He doesn't just he doesn't just nah. he doesn't just go with a, with a with a with a firm body and shoulder charge. He he swings a little bit with his with his, you say his shoulder. Let's go with shoulder. He swings a little bit. There's a bit of a cock of the arm there. You can see it clearly. That is a that's a deliberate and there's with with force. You can say he exaggerated it. He held it held his face. Blah blah blah. It's a clear foul. It's not. I mean, for me, it's not even it's not even a debate. And that's reflected with in in the. The, the way that every single referee and every single TV station, the referee chief, all of them—I mean, they can all be 
There can all this can many all be one, of them. This can many, all be one big conspiracy. No, no, if, no, if no, but many of them have also said that the Arnautovic file in the same situation should be taken. Well, that's fine, and I've said, I've yeah. said the same thing. So I'm just saying, why don't we just let's just own each incident and say, look, yeah. that was you know. I don't think you can compare them, but I do. I do think it was a foul. I think he's gone through. He hasn't won the ball. Arnautovic has got his body on the ball, uh, and 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 I think it's a foul. Um, but but you know, but again, anyway, let's move on. Uh, I can say that I can say that our original recording was a lot more explosive yeah, than that. Was. But, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, there we go. Um, I saw that was still still reasonably entertaining. Um, let, let's move on to Salerno Tana Juventus. Um, I did. Yeah, can first, we just can we just talk about a couple of things? The first thing I, I want to can we just can I want to ask you just the, the, the first thing. Game. Yeah, go on. I just want to end, end the into the game. Because I don't think, regardless of all this refereeing nonsense, Inter's arrogance, I was livid after the game. I was not happy when Inter won that game. I was furious. Because this is now the fourth, fifth Serie A game this season where Inter's where Inter are so bloody arrogant and full of themselves without any reason and cause to be so. They were lucky to win all three points. Let's not beat around the bush. They were lucky as hell. They did not deserve to win that game based on their arrogance alone. Not, and, and that is just exemplified by Nicolo Barella. I know that goal wouldn't have stood, okay? I'm, I'm perfectly aware of it. But when you've got an open net in a 2-1 tight game as crazy as that, and you don't pass, you don't put it into the back of the net, but you try to be cute and pass your teammate because he's struggling and blah, blah, blah. That screams of arrogance. And that's what I feel this this Inter drives me crazy with. Is there self, is there arrogance? Exemplified no more than that, than Marko Arnautovic. I mean, my God in heaven, who does this guy think he is? He walks around and struts like he's got the talent and career of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, when in fact he's barely delivered on par with Zlatan Muslimovic up until this point. And he goes around strutting around like he's the big boy and big man. And misses sitters, can't even hold the ball up, and is, produces one of the worst substitutions I've seen an interplayer do. It's this arrogance needs to needs to be addressed, and I'm and I'm going to give you a good segue now because I think unless they sign a striker in January, Juve are winning the Scudetto, Inter or not. There's no chance. There is no chance. The, Alexis Sanchez and Marco Arnautovic are ex players. They should be playing exhibition matches, raising funds for charities. It's embarrassing to see. And, and Inter don't seem to want to understand that. They don't seem to want to own that. And unless they bring in a striker in January, Juventus are winning this. No, no uh, chance Inter are winning this. I, I don't know about that because, well, if we look at the Seleni Tana versus Juventus game, I mean, Juventus <laughs> really weren't good uh, in this game. Um, I mean, the, 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 the first half was, was, was abysmal. Uh, they had a 0.37 XG. They didn't have a shot on target until the... I think about a minute before before they got the equaliser, Juventus, and really it was the red card, which um, which which well it it helped them massively. Um, I don't want to say change the game because Juventus were always in possession and the game itself was the same pattern. Um, but if you look at the way Juventus played before they were sending off and after sending off, it was slow tempo, moving the ball way too slow, way too predictable, way too easy for Salernitana to just set up and get players behind the ball and in position to to defend. It was just pass the ball out wide, Declan Rice passes sideways, <laughs> cross the ball in, that's it. And that's why I, I objected to, to last week when we were having this debate over Juventus-Roma and you were saying, oh, you know, Juventus can have patterns of play in attack and, well, and, and, and Roma, and Roma can't. Thing, and yeah. I objected to it and I said, look, Juventus have a structure which yeah. Roma don't have. Fair enough. But the patterns of play are, well, I think we saw in this game that this is where Juventus still really do need to improve a lot. And it's just, you can't just, I mean, it worked in this game. People will yeah. reply and say, well, Juventus scored both their goals off crosses <laughs> in this game. But it's just get the ball out wide, cross it in, cross it into the box. It was, it was just, it was, it really wasn't good. And, and what got Juventus through in this game is what is their biggest strength? And is probably the only thing that maybe if by March or April they're still in touch with, with Inter 
especially with Inter if they've got extra Champions League games and if Inter start to feel the heat a little bit, the only thing that can maybe get them above Juventus, less so the personnel, because for me, even if you want to talk about Alexis and you want to talk about Arnautic, there's no doubt that, that Inter have the best squad, they have the best team, they've scored the most goals by a mile, they've conceded the least goals, they're the best team and squad, there's no doubt about it for me. But what Juventus do have is they have this determination and this spirit that seems to get them through. Uh, and that is that is undeniable. You can see that by the number of late goals. You know, when, when Manchester United used to score loads of... And I'm not for one second comparing this Juventus team to Man United late 90s team. But when Man United used to score loads of late goals under Ferguson and they used to call it Fergie time, I remember saying it myself. I was a kid, so I understand football as well as I do now. I used to say, oh, lucky Man United. They're so lucky scoring mm. all these late goals, injury time goals. Oh, they're so lucky... But you know what? There's a determination and spirit in this Juventus that they never, never give up. And that is, there's no doubt about that. We can talk about the lack of quality all we want in this game. Uh, but I do think Inter have it as well. Listen, don't forget, regardless of whether the goal should have stood or not, Inter scored in injury time. You know, Inter, Inter scored. Okay, they missed a penalty afterwards. That's another debate in itself. But they, you know, Inter have been scoring late goals and Inter have got that. So I think both teams, both Inter and Juventus have this, this never say die spirit, which is, which is really, really, um, it's amazing to watch. I think it's, it's really fascinating and it keeps you on the edge of your seat and wanting to watch right to the end, even in games where, I mean, Juventus didn't look like getting the winner in this game, let's be honest. And then bang out of nowhere that they, they scored. So I think, yeah, the determination and the spirit of this Juventus, the Fino alla fine, the classic you know, Juventus spirit is uh, is definitely there. It's definitely there. It's definitely there, and it's all thanks to Max Allegri. You know, it's he's literally instilled this uh, at Juve, this inevitability about Juve, um, this notion that you know, he, you know me, I, I'm a firm believer that coaches, just like players, can have bursts of form and bursts uh, uh, where they're in and out of form. Right now, Max Allegri can do no wrong. The players, he's he is Juventus leader. This is an inexperienced Juve side. It doesn't have very many champions and experienced winners. And so he is obviously the leader. He's obviously the person they look to. And right now, every tactical change he makes pays off, um, even when it doesn't look good, even when things are looking dreary and horrible and, and it's not looking well. He, he manages to get them to believe in themselves and keep, you know, grinding on, even when it's ugly and it's not looking good, and they keep grinding out these one goal difference wins and scoring late as well. I mean, I, I, I was watching that game and immediately after, you know, after Salernitana scored, I was like, okay, it depends on how it how it looks in the 50th minute. But immediately when the second half began, I knew you were going to win in the 90th minute thanks to a two one thanks to a goal. I knew it because it was just it was just it was just in the air, and 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 that. You have to give that to Allegri. He is a winner. He has a winner's mentality. He knows what it takes to win at Juve. He knows what it means to to be at Juve and be chased and be the one chasing, and 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 he knows how to how to get his players to believe in this team and in this project. And he's doing a fantastic job with it. I think from a psychological side, um, and and you know after triggering Acerbi for a couple of weeks, now he's now he's doing this whole song and dance about. Us, Scudetto, oh, come on, we need to secure the fourth spot. That's what we're fighting for. I mean, it's, 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 it's funny because he's so sarcastic and ironic and it's classical, uh, classic Max, and, and I love it. I love him. I think he's brilliant. Um, but he, he, does, he does it for a reason, and he knows what he's doing. And the team are on the him and him and the players are on the same page, and that's why there's not much trouble. He changes players all the time. He 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 changes systems in games. He 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 tinkers, but they all react to it. And and right now, I'd say he's probably the most in-form coach in all of Serie A, if that makes sense. He got he got his um, changes right in this game. He brought on uh, Illing Junior for Kostic at, at half time, and obviously Illing Junior scored the equaliser. Illing Junior is an interesting one as well because mm. he was he was. I mean, I know for a fact through people I'm speaking to that Juventus wanted to sell him going into December, even going towards January. Juventus planned to sell Illing Junior this month. Make. Uh, to 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 raise raise the money uh, to to raise the money to to, to buy a, a central midfielder, and uh, but he's actually he's actually hit a good bit of form, um, Illing Junior recently. So that's um that's something for them to to think about now, Juventus, and whether they should still sell Illing Junior 
Um, but um, but but yeah, Dusan Vlaovic. I want I, w- I want to talk about him because he he had his best performance of the season last season uh, last week against Roma, uh, and you know we said I said certainly that you know. Let's not all get carried away now. I've seen some people on social media say, oh, yeah, see, Dusan Vlaovic, the real Dusan Vlaovic is here. You know, it's one game um, against, you know, one opponent. And he was playing against Llorente, who, who's had a good season, but he's not a particularly good player. And if you saw him, he got hauled off against uh, against Atalanta at the weekend after getting absolutely terrorised by Mirantruk in that game. Um, you know, Vlaovic is going to play against different uh, different markers, He's going to play against different types of team. I mean, Salernitana were, were even deeper than Roma. They were playing on a wet pitch, a very heavy pitch, not very good conditions, um, different type of game. Juventus are chasing the game rather than than Roma than playing 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 against a team when you're in the lead. Um, you know, so totally different dynamic. And Vlaovic struggled for, for for long periods of this game, first half especially, wasn't holding it up well. But he was better in the second half. And what I like about uh, Vlaovic certainly is. He was, I think, for a long time, very defeatist in his attitude, his mentality. He he looked like someone who'd almost not given up on his Juventus career, but almost given up. Like he he almost, you know, he went onto the pitch and 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 he wasn't playing like a champion, like a like a player, like a person that that was with the authority that that was there's, you know, I'm the man. And now he he has got that again, like we said before, the determination and the spirit of Juventus as a whole. I I feel that and see that. In, in in Vlaovic and we saw that even with his celebration and and you know taking his shirt off and you know just his anger he has that anger in him exactly. now that he, that he wants it uh, he has a and, point to prove doesn't he? Yeah. he plays with like a man who's, who's got a point to prove even though he doesn't succeed with everything even though he had a pretty bad first half he he plays with that kind of rabia you know like you say mm. rage or anger is, is I guess but he has a point to prove um, and he he wants to show that he's good enough to be at Juve. He's good enough to be Juve's number nine. And when you have a player with that mentality there, and you've got him in that headspace where you keep him focused and disciplined, but he's playing, channeling his anger in the right way. I mean, that that's a brilliant. That's that's really well done, Allegri. Again, because that's that's the job of a coach to keep the players mentally fresh and in the right frame frame of mind. And it's yeah. worked with 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 Vlaovic. So well, that's far. what we're asking for. That's what we're asking. Yeah. We're asking for for, for noticeable changes that yeah. you can att- attribute to the coach. Until now, we haven't seen that. This, you, you, yes, absolutely. You have to give that to to the to the coach or the coaching staff as well. You know. So you know that's good. The, what there is something that I'm still we still need to see from from Vlaovic, and that is. I don't I, I don't think that his his shots on the turn are are good enough or fast enough smooth enough. He doesn't turn on the what we say the turn on the sixpence where you you're back mm. to goal and you you you've got the ball and you, you turn and you get a shot away uh, at goal. For me he 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 still moves he still moves too slow. I mean, I once, I think I once likened him to a World War tank, World War One tank in the way that, in the way that he turns around. But, you know, I mean, I was, of course, I was exaggerating when I said that, but he, he does move too slow when he's, when he's got his back to goal and he, and he has a chance to turn and get a shot on goal. He moves so slow that it's always, there's always the defenders blocks it all the time, every single time. Um, and, you know, he, that needs to improve because that is one of the key, key aspects of a, of a, of a striker especially when you're in the penalty box. You know, the ball comes into you, control, turn, shoot. Uh, he's still too slow on that. And we, I did see that a couple of times in this game. I think Yomba got, got a few blocks in. Um, he should have had a penalty, though, while we're talking about in- penalty yeah. incidences and what, what... It was an absolute clear penalty. The cross comes in from the right. Um, <coughs> and Yomba doesn't even look at the ball, doesn't even challenge for the ball. He just just comes in and barges barges uh, Vlaovic uh, to the floor. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a definite... It's a definite penalty, um, but again, it's something that no one even no one even talked about. Everyone well, talked about the Gatti. Salernitana after the game were furious because before the sending off on the Salernitana player, there's an there's a, there's a clear free kick for for Salernitana for Salernitana. I mean, these these you know that's the situation we're talking about. But if we were to blow this up into the biggest scandal, you know, with with Gatti's challenge as well, which is a yellow, it's not a red. But I mean, yeah, that's, but that's the a, point. I guess that's the point I was making in the, the whole overall point that I'm making is that you know these are the these are the kind of things. I mean, we can talk about these things. Um, but but anyway anyway look I think that um, this wasn't a good performance as a whole as Juventus it's not a performance you expect against the bottom team in the league there weren't that many positive individual performances I think you take Vlaovic you take 
Illing Jr. obviously positive off the bench, then I think you're pretty struggling, to be honest with you. I think Kostic was abysmal in the first half and then he was hauled off. The the centre midfielders were, were so lacking in imagination. It was I mean, They really missed Locatelli in this game, Juventus. I mean, it was just sideways passes, sideways passes all the time. Declan Rice passes, as I call them. <laughs> uh, and, um, the other thing, oh, Yildiz was quieter today. Milik was really poor. Uh, just shooting long-range, stupid long-range shots that he had never had a chance of scoring. Um, Danilo is someone to keep an eye on, though. Um, I I think Danilo's really been struggling since his return from from injury. Um, so many goals that the that, that Juventus have been conceding have been down his side. His side, the ball played into that channel uh, between him and, and Kostic. And and we've seen a, a, at least three goals now that I can, that I can remember. The Monza goal... The Frosinone goal and 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 this one as well. Um, so Danilo, I don't know. I, I don't know whether there's even a debate that maybe he should be dropped and it should be Gatti, Bremer, and Rugani that should start. Maybe, but I do think Danilo is important for his construction from the back. He's the only one that can actually pass the ball out the back, and I think that is important. And that's maybe something you don't notice until he's not there. Um, but but yeah, he ha- he's been struggling defensively uh, a lot. Uh, but talking uh, talking about um, injuries, though, um, my final point I just want to make is on um, Chiesa because um, he missed this game with another injury, pulled up in training, and it's becoming a concern now. The number of injuries that he's had since he's returned from his ACL. This is his fourth injury this season, fourth injury break. Don't forget that he missed the first two international breaks for Italy as well. Uh, and last season, he had seven different injury breaks after returning from the ACL. So that's 11 since returning from the ACL, it's 11 in what, not much longer than a year, really. Kind of what we're talking, 12, 13 months. There was a, there was a break for the World Cup as well. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's, um, it's a little bit concerning, I think, with Chiesa. Um, not so much for you, not as much, well, for Juventus as well, but for, for Juventus, for Chiesa, for the Italy national team ahead of the Euros and beyond. I mean, too many injuries. I want, I'm so glad you brought that up because I've been thinking about this for quite some time. Um, and that is after an ACL, who is Federico Chiesa, the player? Is he the player who, before the injury, in my opinion, and I stand by that, had the raw talent to be a Ballon d'Or, uh, Ballon d'Or winner in talent? But that's what I've always thought. But after an ACL, given that he's lost a bit of explosive explosivity, he's lost a bit of pace, I think what, who is Federico Chiesa? is the more correct question. What kind of player is he? Should I th- I personally think his days as a wide playing, like a wing back or a winger, is a, are over. He doesn't have that in him, which is kind of funny because it brings me back to the point that Allegri was right all along. He should play centrally in a two-man attack. Um, and I think after the ACL, that has to be the, the, the point now. Like because I just don't see him doing that, and I'm, and these niggling injuries that follow after an ACL that keep haunting him, this is a problem, and and it's a shame because I, in my opinion, he was he was going to be the biggest star, Italian star, with the Italian national team, you know, and and that's a problem. Uh, listen, I, I don't think I, I don't see the correlation on position between position and injury, uh, but I, I mean I think that look if you look at how he played for Italy. Um, in the in the last the, the last international break, um, he was he was fantastic, wasn't he, Chiesa? Uh, and 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 you know, so he I I, I still uh, I'm still certain that that being a winger is his position. I think the question is more, can he play in the same way as that winger um, after an ACL, and whether the way that he plays, the way that he twists and turns, the way that he plays, such a you know, he puts himself in. Uh, in positions that do leave himself open for injury, I think the way that he moves uh, and the way that he invites challenges and the way that, that he gets, you know, take gets gets a uh, rough treatment from from uh, from from defenders. That is that leaving him open to injury? Does he need to adapt his game a little bit to stop him from getting injured? And if he does do that, then can he? How can he possibly be the same player when those are his strengths, aren't they? So I think that is, for me, that's more the concern rather than the actual position because I've never been truly convinced in him as a as a, as a centre forward, um, despite his attributes. And I think that's shown. And, and I know for a fact he doesn't like playing as a um, from his camp that he doesn't like playing as a as a as a centre forward. So I think those are the concerns, um, and especially when you look at the number of injuries he he's got. I mean, 
Yeah, we we had a discussion, didn't we? Who should Italy take to the Euros? Yeah. But I think they need to maybe they need to take an extra attacker if they're going to take Chiesa because because can you can't go with let's say five attackers or maybe even if you take six attackers with three positions and in Chiesa what happens if he gets an injury for three weeks four weeks I mean you're suddenly in trouble so I think that's something also you need to you need to take into mind and thank God Juventus have had Yildiz coming through now because you're talking again you're talking about Anelovic and Sanchez well Juventus could have been could have had Vlaovic and. Vlaovic uh, and and Milik and and uh, and Moise Keane, and that's it for the rest of the season. Um, but Yildiz has come through and he's developed, and um, you know he's he, okay. He didn't have a good game in this game, but he looks like looks like a, a really huge talent. But also talking about bad pals, he is getting kicked all over the place. Yildiz um, as well, getting some awful challenges. We saw we've seen in, in the last few games. So again, that's something that. You know, referees, we're talking about referees. They need to, yeah, they need to, it's fine. It's a man's sport. He's a kid. But, you know, some of the some of the treatment he's getting, he's getting kicked all over the place. So, yeah, let's not kill our youngsters. Um, no, absolutely. Absolutely. But, I mean, the thing with Juve is, and that's something we have to give praise to, and I think it's, a, it's going to be another great segue for you to the next point, to the next segment, and that is the youth. Juve and Milan they have to be praised. I mean, we've both been very critical of young players not getting a chance. Whether or not they have no choice or not, that's true, both of these clubs, because of their finances. But the fact of the matter is they are playing youngsters. And the youngsters they are playing are delivering. I saw a stat, I don't know if you saw it as well, uh, about Juventus. Let me just bring it up quickly. um, About Juventus being the first club in the Serie A to have five players born after, what was it, 2000? Let me just quickly... Yeah, Juventus are the only team with three goal scorers born after 2003 in the Serie A this season. Illing Jr., Yildiz and Miretti. Only Barcelona have more in the big five European leagues and they have four. Fair play, fair play. Listen, I I, I said that even last season and the the season before when I was always (laughs) negative about Juventus, it's the only thing that Juventus have done right in the last, let's say, four years four or five years in terms of as a club in terms of is in terms of uh you know building and and that is that is the 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 youth the youth policy i mean they are they are bringing through players there's no doubt about it um it would be nice to see a few more italians but but um but yeah um they're, they're, yeah they, i mean hoisin also made his debut for for roma um last yeah. night as well um it came on as a sub so, so yeah, that that is that certainly a positive, as it is for Milan. Positives as well, because we had Chaka Traore scoring his his first goal for for Milan as a substitute. And he's not the not the first one for uh, Milan youngster to score this season either. Um, it was a dominant win for Milan, three nil um, at Empoli, uh, and it's um, yes, it's been a, a good little recovery for Milan because Pioli was on the brink of the sack, and now they won three games in a row. Um, I. I want to single out, though, Rafael Liao in this game because we were very, very critical him on our last show of 2023. I was, anyway. Mm. And I said that it's been a year to forget 2023, how he only had three goals and four assists in the first half of the season in 2023. And now he started 2024 with a goal in the Coppa Italia. And I thought it was outstanding in this game. He was doing his man every time. He got the assist for Loftus-Cheek. He was setting up other chances. So I think it's been a good start to 2024 for Rafael Liao. Yeah, no, I, I I I disagree with you a little bit on that and like that. I think twenty twenty three was a year to forget. I think the the first half of the Serie A season definitely forget. But I think for in the spring, I mean, there's no way that Milan get to the Champions League semi final if it wasn't for Rafael Leao. Uh, and I think that should, you know, and, and he's still not, he's not still not the finished product. I think my criticism with him, and I've thought a little bit about this because one of our patrons who's a Milan fan. We've been uh, Liban. We've been discussing this quite a bit. Me and and also Dennis, who's also a Milan fan, they're both Swedish, and we talk quite a bit about this. And 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 I've I've thought a lot about what they said. And they said, look, if Rafael Leao was the player you think he is, he wouldn't be at Milan. He would be at Real Madrid. He'd be at PSG. He'd be at Man City. He's not the finished product. So therefore, you can't judge him with those parameters. And I'm thinking, I, I don't agree with them. Because I think that if you're the number 10 at Milan, if you're the gold letter star player who's supposed to carry Milan, and that is what Milan have made it clear that Leao is supposed to be, then I want to see development and growth. I agree to a certain extent that the way that Milan have changed how they play uh, has hindered him a little bit. And I did discuss last week, well, is is that the wise choice in the short term? No, 
but maybe it is in the long term because if Liao learns to handle this situation, then he is he will move towards being a complete player. And let's remember that it took Lautaro Martinez quite a few years to become the goal scorer that we're seeing him become this season, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm I my criticism comes from frustration because in this game against Empoli, the lightness with which he sprints away from these poor players, it's like it's 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 like death taxes and Rafael Leal running past you. It's like you, you know he's coming. There's nothing you can do. And he he's so light on his feet. He, he sprints past them and they know what's coming. They double down on them. They triple down on him. They just can't get anywhere near him. He's doing Trivella crosses, which are fantastic. But then as soon as he gets into finishing positions, he just squanders it. And it annoys me because to me, the difficult part is getting into those positions. The lovely drop of the shoulder, racing past with with breeze and then the tap he misses the tap ins and that annoys me um and 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 that's what i want to see from him because i think his talent really is world class i think he's a unique player um and i think that's where the frustration comes in uh, but we're not asking for him to be the finished product though are we no, no let's be honest no, we're asking no. for him to improve and develop yes. that's the whole point and he hasn't developed since the, since the scudetto season i don't think he's developed i don't think he has the numbers mm. so, the numbers have, de- have declined you know, well, this season, for sure. The numbers have gone off a cliff so far this season. He's still got time to, to recover. But, you know, the first half of this season, the numbers have, have plummeted uh, this season. Um, so, you know, we're not asking for him to become Kylian Mbappe. You know, we're, we're asking him to just, we're asking for development and to improve. Uh, and he hasn't. If any, he's stagnated. And if anything, he's he's uh, he's declined. And he hasn't improved the areas which which we've always said, the, the unpolished parts of his game. You know, he's still when he has chances, he doesn't doesn't finish uh, clinically. He still doesn't make the the right final pass too often. Um, his decision making, and and you know, so these areas he still hasn't improved in his game, and those are the areas that he needs to improve if he is going to become the the finished the finished the uh, finished product. So yeah. Um, yeah, that 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 is the that is the the, the issue for for sure. Um, but yeah, as a whole, Milan as a whole, I thought they were good in this game. They dominated the game. Nice goal from from Loftus Cheek. Um, they were they they were comfortable comfortable winners. And um, apart from another injury, but you know it wouldn't be a Milan game <laughs> without an injury. Um, Florenzi Florenzi get injured. I, I thought they were good. And now we're seeing that they they now entered the race to sign Radu Dragosin as well. So that's a yeah. Not sure what to think about that one, uh, Radu Dragosin. Do they really need a centre back? I mean, I guess they do for next season, um, but maybe not. I mean, they, 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 they've got a lot of injuries. But yeah. when I read that, when when I read that that those links, um, I started immediately thinking Antonio Conte. Like, well, that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like to me, that just screams that he's coming back and he's going to Milan because he wants to be the first coach to win the Serie A with Juve, Inter and Milan. And you know my my position on this. I think Milan are better side in a 3-4-2-1 or a 3-4-3 or a 3-5-2, however you want to play it. Well, if they brought um, the right players, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think they already have a back three that can play there. they got Teo Hernandez can be as a wing back. What they do need is a right winger, a right wing back, right winger, whatever. I think Leao as one of the, two, you know, is a, is one of the two in a three four two one or or a wide player in a three four three, uh, and and you need a number nine as well. Um, mm. I mean, I think they're just two or three players away. And Dragosin it follows the Milan standard in the sense that he's young. There's resale value. He won't command high that too too much too much in wages, and he can play in a back three. And also, he's really improved. Um, I mean, I guess Inter. I thought it was so obvious, but he. He's really improved his his passing from the back this season because I was very critical of his passing in the past. I was like, is this guy even a football player? But he, I think he's really, really taken strides this year. And it's an interesting signing. It really is. If it happens, if he doesn't go to Tottenham, which you know could still happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's move on. Uh, actually, no, just before we do move on, uh, just a quick note on, on Empoli. Um, I, I, I yeah. thought I said at the start <laughs> of the season, I, I was I thought they'd get relegated. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain now they are getting relegated unless they can do something really good on the market, bring in at least one attacker that can get them goals. And mm. they need to do, they need to have a have a really good January transfer market for me. Otherwise, I'm certain that they're, they're going down. They're just they're just not good enough. No, look, it's it, they're, and they're not going to do that because that's not who Empoli are. They're this tiny provincial side from a cute from a lovely little place in in Tuscany where. They they build their 
entire structure on bringing youth, young and young talented players up um, and, and selling them on. And then they go down and then they regroup and then they come up again. This is who Empoli are. And, you know, hopefully we'll see them soon again within a couple of years after they go down this year, this time around. Baldanzi moves on and, and we see them with a new batch of young talented players, which, which they launch the careers of, like we've seen with many, many a time with Empoli. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Napoli, though, I mean, they yeah. are. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's, it's getting ridi- it's getting absolutely ridiculous now. I mean, I, I, again, they were played I feel, off the park by Torino. Oh, they were, and I, I feel like you know I'm just repeating myself every single week now with with well now with Mazzari before with Garcia, but but now with Mazzari uh, again, I say it again. He, 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 I mean, Napoli are down to ninth now. They're thrashed three 0 They're twenty points off Inter at the top of the table. I mean, as title defenses go. This is one of the worst title defences, not just in Serie A history, in, in football history. And, and I said it, that I said it when he was appointed, and I've said it consistently since. Walter Mazzari at Napoli, they're not going. I don't think they're going to get top four. And it, in, you know, they're now. I mean, they, they can't be anybody now. They're losing to everybody now. It wasn't just the big teams at the start. They're now they're now losing to Frosinone and they're losing to Torino, and they and they they can't beat Monza and. His record since coming to Napoli, Walter Mazzari, is 1-3, drawn one, lost six. They've now gone four games in a row without scoring. How is that even possible with the attackers Napoli have got? Just go four scoreless games in a row. They have eight goals in 10 games. since In the 10 games that Mazzari's been there, they've scored eight goals. Six of those 10 games that Mazzari's been there... They haven't, they haven't scored and they've got five scoreless games in the last six games. Then you go to the defence. So it's not just the attack. You go to the defence. They've conceded nine goals in their last four games. And these aren't top, top level teams that they played in these four games. Uh, again, like you said, I mean, they were torn, torn apart. They lost 3-0, but it could have been more. And, and Torino, this is a Torino team that we know. <laughs> we know what Ivan Juric's strengths are. We saw them in this game as well. But we also know what their weaknesses are. Ivan Juric and Torino's weaknesses are they don't score many goals, they don't create many chances. They but it has had, changed. They had the we fourth. Have to be fair. We have it, to be well, fair. They hasn't, it's changed for this game. They had the fourth worst attack in Serie A before this game. No, but ever before, since Duvan Zapata came in, I, I mean, I do watch, you know how much I love Ivan Juric and, and his, his football, so I do watch them, and, and it has improved. The first 10, 15 games of the season were, it was, it was mentally difficult to watch Torino. It was painful to watch them. But since Zapata's really got flying, he's been he he they've really they're 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 much more fluid in attack. They're much they're creating more chances. They're not you know I think in this game they had two point eight two point zero eight xg. They they had ten shots six on target. They they dominated Napoli and they played in a way that was so so impressive. And and they're in they're in form now, uh, Torino. They really are in form, um, and they're. You know they're sneaking there. No, they're know. not far off the top four either. The way yeah, it comes, I mean. comes to top four, yeah, in a bit, but they're not that far off. <laughs> they're really not. And yeah. and but I got to say that midfield, that double pivot of Ilich and uh, Ricci, Ritchie. yeah, I I I'm in love. <laughs> like it's the way he, you know, uh, it's 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 so nice. Like Jurich, watch. I'll give Jurich one thing. He's not bad at developing players. So He's I hope I really I really that. hope he can do that with Richie and uh, for the Italian national team that is and Bellanova. And Bellanova is well, really good in this game. And yeah. Bongiorno was outstanding. I mean, and Kofi Bongior- Gigi- Bongiorno in the air is absolutely. Uh, he's all, he's he just wins everything, doesn't he? In the in he's the air, he just he reminds me of Materazzi a little bit in the air. Mm. He's similar, left footed, but similar kind of way he kind of hangs in the air and and with the headers, big mm. powerful headers. Yeah, and that's like the way he scored as well. It was kind of a Materazzi header. Yeah, uh, no, he's got that. Yeah, I know what you mean when you say that. No, it's no, I, I, I say I do not want to play Torino right now. They they're in form, and and they're mm. a difficult side. To, to play they're a difficult them. side to, they're a difficult side but at the end of the day they still had and they have been in, they haven't been improving but they had the fourth worst attack in Serie A mm. and Napoli let in three goals against them and should have let in more there was a there was a there was a get there was an incident where they missed a, somebody yeah. missed an open goal it hit yeah. the post and then it came out to Zapato then missed another open goal <laughs> on the follow-up I mean this could have been five or six in this game and I kind of wish it had been 
because if this game finishes five or six, then maybe the trigger gets pulled on that. Sorry, because I, I again I keep hearing people saying I've, I've had a few a few people reply to because I put out a tweet yesterday saying look they just have to sack him, and I see people saying well, well who are they going to re- replace him with? Well, I'm going to read out a list of available free agents. Now I know some of these are not going to be realistic, but I'm just going to just just want to show just just so everybody knows who is available right now. Antonio Conte. Hansi Flick, the former Germany national team. Julian Lopetegui, who's a very good manager, just yeah, been, just been left sacked by Wolves, wasn't it? Igor Tudor, uh, and then if we go, then we can go down a, a little bit more to kind of in terms of level. Ralph Hassan-Hutzel, former Southampton manager. Graham Potter, uh, AVB, Villas Boas, Yogi Law, who I think's finished, but he's available. Laurent Blanc, uh, Lucien Favre. Uh, Jesse Marsh, if we, you know, Serie A loves going American. I mean, you know, these are all coaches are all available. I think they'll all do well. Most of those will do better than 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 Matt Sorry, but if we look at the ones at the top, I mean, Antonio Conte, of course, is going to be very very difficult. But Hansi Flick, Julian Lopetegui, Igor Tudor. I'm sorry, there is no reason why if the, if ADL what if De Laurentiis wants to make it happen, there is no reason why he can't go to Hansi Flick to Lopetegui or Tudor. I'd go for Lopetegui or Tudor because they're, they're they're club coaches. They've done it in the club game, whereas whereas Flick hasn't. But I would go to Lopetegui and Tudor, and I'd offer them an 18 month or a 30 month contract. If you have to, if it, if it has to cost you, even if it costs you 10 million over that over that period, 10 million, right? That is better. That is much better. Paying that ten million, making sure you get in the Champions League, and than staying with Mazzari, failing to get in the Champions League, and losing out on a potential I don't know eighty to one hundred million or a guaranteed fifty million. What's better? Even if you have to in the summer, pay off Lopetegui or Tudor because you've already got a coach lined up for next season. You've already got I don't know Vincenzo Italiano or someone that's already been agreed for next season, and you only want a temporary coach. Right? That's fine. Just, just pay them off. You know, if a coach won't accept a short-term contract, which most won't, it doesn't matter. Just give them an 18-month contract. Get them a 30-month contract. It costs you 10 million in total. So be it. At least you get in the Champions League. You bring in that money. If you do it this way and stick with Matsari, you're not getting into Champions League. You're going to lose all that money. Your players' values are all going to drop because they're all they're all plummeting the value of their players. And you're going to lose Ossiman. You're going to lose Karat Skeli because they're not going to want to not play in Europe. So... I mean, this is the whole issue that I had with appointing Matsari in the first place. He should have just given Tudor an 18-month contract when it got to the end of the season, just pay him off his other year. You, what, how much is, he, is Tudor going to earn a year? Two million? Three million at most? Pay, what, you're going to pay him three million to pay him off? Well, well done, uh, De Laurentiis. Now you're going to lose 50 to 100 million because of that, just for the saving three million. It's pathetic. No, it is pathetic, but more than anything, I mean, he did come out and take responsibility for what happened, but... I think the players need to take a little bit of responsibility here too. Because, yes, he's made lots of mistakes and he's owned them, but it doesn't justify that lax attitude and not showing that you care. And I mean, it, it's it's an absolute shit show right now. And it's it's unacceptable. And Mas- so- oh, well, you, can, you can say Masaki showed that he cared too much. I mean, as debuts oh, go, I yeah. mean, come oh, on. Has, has a player ever been? Right. <laughs> I mean, that, that, this is that this is oh. that this just goes down into one of the worst debuts of all time. And four yeah. minutes into his debut as a sub, as soon as I saw that challenge, I'm like, he's going to get sent off. Yeah, as soon as I saw the replay, it's, that's a red. Yeah. I mean, there's there's, no, there's nothing to talk about. You can't. Yeah. What the hell is your leg doing up that high up with a stud showing in his knee? I mean, yeah. well, use your brain. It was, mean, re- nice. it was reckless. It was too keen. He was just so you know. nice, nah, and I feel bad for him as well because he's the Napoli lad. It's a beautiful story, really. I mean, you know, he's from yeah. Napoli, grew up there. Oh, no, I felt and sorry for him. He had to do the long too. walk, of sh- the long walk yeah, of shame. I felt, I felt really because, bad for the him. long walk of shame because he was on the, it was right on the other yeah, touchline, and he had to walk all the way across the pitch to 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 come off. But yeah, I mean, that is. Uh, I'm just trying to think of like the worst debuts ever. I mean, it's got to be up there. I remember Thomas Repka. Do you remember him, the former yeah. um, uh, Fiorentina defender? I remember him for West Ham getting sent off like minutes after m- minutes after coming on, um, and then getting sent off in his uh, in his I think his third game after he got sent off up again. Uh, Woodgate, do you remember Jonathan Woodgate for Real yes, Madrid? I do. <laughs> he got he scored an own goal and got sent off in the same game. Um, so, I, but I think this is this is up there. <laughs> this is up there with the worst debuts of all time. And, it, and if anything sums up how bad Napoli's transfer market has been, it's this: like literally 
everything De Laurentiis turned to uh, touched in the transfer market of 2020, summer 2022, turned to gold. Everything that he touched in the transfer market, the coaches and the players coming in in the transfer market 2023 has just turned to <laughs> to absolute shit, hasn't it? It's just no, yeah, really, yeah. everything, every single player they've brought in. I mean, Kahuste, total disaster. Um, uh, Lindstrom, total disaster. Now, Mazzocchi, total disaster. Garcia, total disaster. Mazzari, total disaster. I mean, everything, everyone is, um, yeah, where does it stop with Napoli? I, I am really starting to think that they don't even make it to Europe this season. And maybe that's a blessing in disguise for them. But let's remember, they're only five points off. Um, and I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know and how. There is, well, there's half the season left to play, so we can't, you know, we should They could there. get it together, but I just, not with Matsari. I, I'm still insistent with a good, with one of those coaches that I read out. I still think they could get in Champions League. I really do. They've yeah, got the players. Absolutely. It's going to be difficult, though, the next month because they're without... Ossiman, they're without Anguissa for the a Africa Cup of Nations. But also, one thing I, we, we should say that Antonio Conte was in the stands yeah, for I this saw, game. That, is, yeah. there, is it just a coincidence? They're in Turin, they're playing Torino, or is Ugh. there, could there potentially be anything more to it? I just, Conte coming into Napoli, I mean, we would love it. We already did a segment on that a couple of weeks, it was a month ago when, when he, mm. the rumour started. I mean, nothing would be, nothing would be more beautiful than that happening. Um, because simply for the drama, <laughs> but because you know that there's no way that him and De Laurentiis are going to be friends for, for, for much long, and it's going to be fireworks. Um, so, yeah, but, but I, I just can't see him going there, to be honest. I think he has to, I think he has to um, choose his next move very, very wisely, um, and he can't afford to have another Tottenham, or else his career... I think we'll take a trajectory to the to the. To the I don't. Yeah, I don't see that happening in Italy. I think he. I think he will. Yeah, he'll definitely get it right. I think at his next club. I'm. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's talk about the top four race now, and it's really, really tight. Um, the top four race now. I'm just going to get the table up so I can read out um what the what the points tallies are. So we've got Fiorentina in fourth with 33. Bologna 5th, 32. Then we've got Atalanta and Lazio on 30. Then we've got Roma in 8th on 29. Then Napoli in 9th on 28. And even Torino in 10th are on 27. So between 4th and 9th, there's 5 points. 4th and 10th, there's 6 points. It's really, really tight. And that's been reinforced by the results this weekend because Fiorentina lost. 4th place Fiorentina lost to Sassuolo 1-0. We're talking about VAR and referees. I mean, the second Sassuolo car. I mean, that is shocking. So that got disallowed. It didn't matter in the end, but still. Uh, Bologna could only draw with Genoa. They got an injury time equaliser. Uh, then Lazio continued their good little run. They beat Udinese 2-1 away. And then in the nighttime game, Roma and Atalanta drew 1-1 in a game which I really enjoyed that game. I thought it was a fantastic watch, uh, Roma-Atalanta. And um, it was... I think Roma probably deserved to win, to be honest, uh, that, that game. They created quite a few chances and they should have won it. But uh, Mourinho got sent off again. I mean, how many? How did many you send, see how many sending offs? Has he did had? you see? I mean, it's it's truly remarkable to me how he has got the entire fan base behind him. He gets sent off, yeah. and the entire stadium starts chanting his name and applauding him and applauding him. I mean, he's, he can do no wrong. No, I mean, he, he is. No, he could murder. He could murder someone on the pitch on the and, pitch in and, front and, of and, everyone, and, and, and they would all <laughs> applaud him like uh, you know, like it's a uh, <laughs> you know, it's like a Roman emperor. It's just, it's, no, it's. So. it's it's truly remarkable, and I, I really hope he stays. I don't think he will, but I really hope he stays now with with what's his name, Thiago Pinto gone as well. And mm. it's uh, it's well, actually, he left because of money. So maybe he's won. He's he's killed off another sporting director. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's usually what happens. Um, and and we'll see what happens from now on. And and and, and you know who 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 comes in and replaces Thiago Pinto and, and from February onwards, and what ideas they have, and do they want to continue with Mourinho, and how does this season proceed? I mean, the derby in the Coppa Italia against Lazio, the quarterfinal, is going to be. I, I'm not missing Ooh, that. Yeah, that's going to be. I'm not yeah. Sarri and Mourinho when they're both kind of fighting for fourth as well. They're within two points of one another. I mean, Jesus, that's going to be delicious. No, it's certainly going to be mouth watering. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I listen. I think, as we said last week, I think top four is really, really hard to it's call. Impossible. We yeah. can't forget Lazio either. We have to. Speak no, about I mean, that's the thing. Because see, we talk about the coaches, the importance yeah. of a good coach, in, on this pod a lot. 
And we've been obviously Napoli are a shambles. They don't have a coach. Then Roma, we talk about Mourinho's Mourinho, you know, but he's a little bit, you know, maybe a little bit outdated. He's not getting yeah. been able to get the best out of Roma, but still, you know, cups and everything. You could, certainly can't write him out in any of the cups. Um, and then, you know, but then you look at the other contenders. I mean, Atalanta, they're good, but they're not the Atalanta of, of, of a few seasons ago. You know, Bologna, amazing fairy tale, but, you know, they're going to slow down, I think it's for sure. Yeah. Um, and then you've got Fiorentina, who not, neither me or you particularly rate at all this season. But I don't understand they're, they're how they're in there. fourth. Yeah. I, I do not get it. How mm. do they have so many points? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think they're, they're, they're going to keep it. I don't think they're going to keep it up. But, because, not but because, because I think that it's going to take, not going to take that as many points as normal to get fourth. I think that's mm. why it's really difficult to score. But I think the, what Lazio have is, I think Lazio have a coach who, yes, I know that, I know that, the, 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 even if you speak to Lazio fans, that they they were even questioning his position early on in the season. But I feel like with 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 Asari, you know what you're going to get. You know that there's a structure there. You know, do, do you know? Um, do you know Absolutely. where I'm coming from? Like you Absolutely. know. So I feel like you, you're you're almost guaranteed over the long run maybe more consistency from Sari yeah. because because you know he has a a proven structure there that works. Whereas with the other teams, you know, it can all fall apart like it has at Napoli. Uh, and and at Roma, maybe Mourinho's not a modern, modern coach anymore. So, mm. and then the other teams, I think, shouldn't really be good enough to get fourth place. You know, so maybe, maybe Lazio, maybe it's Lazio that, that come, come strong and take fourth. Who who knows? It's, 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 we're halfway point now and it, it really, anything can happen. I mean, we didn't mention it because we've spoken a lot about the referees, but Gianluca Mancini's neck swing on Charles de Ketteler, I don't, I, I could, I just burst out laughing. Did you see that? I didn't, no. I saw Scamacca attempt to stamp on... on no, he on, stamped on his testicles as yeah. a payback. But did you see the neck swing? Like, I didn't, no, no. I, it's like, I mean... What's a what, neck what swing? Hell? What's like, a neck swing? Have you seen, in, you know, in wrestling, when they grab the guy's neck and throw him over? All oh, right. <laughs> like, like he, he literally did. He took his neck and and somersaulted him. Like, I, was, I couldn't believe what I was watching. It's like, you take, you're not even, like, what? How? It, it was mad. And and uh, it's like, it's become a, it's become a me. He's become a meme now. He plays so dirty that it's not even... Like, you can't even get upset. It's like, how is he even allowed on the pitch? No. It, it's it's just mad. And, yeah. and it's, no, that, that was, and, and on the Ketteler too, who <laughs> looks like a lost poor, poor, poor boy. Poor, poor boy, and, yeah. you know, It's like, he literally <laughs> goes and picks on like this, the shyest, most timid little boy in the court. Like, it's just so wrong. The, the, the imagery of it was just so wrong in comedy. No, but it was, it was an insane weekend. I mean, this is classic Serie A shithousery. I was talking to, to, to someone about it, just how this weekend was vintage business beginning of business end of Serie A shithousery in every single game there was arguing controversy angry Italians finger waving accusations hurled now Marotta spoken um answering to Zaza I mean it's, it, it. <laughs> it's just it's just the all I'm saying is Brace, brace, bra- you know, put, put, strap in, strap yourselves in, put on your seatbelts, put your crash helmets on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Like, because, you know, brace yourselves for impact. Because the, the next four, like, people have not, we've not had an Inter v Juve title race for a generation. I mean, I can't even remember the last time we had a serious Inter v Juve um, title race no where uh, where it's actually within two points mm. that energy destabilizes the entire league <laughs> like, and that's what we're seeing everyone is just it's literally angry at one another mm. the referees had a horrible weekend and they need to they need to get on top of this because otherwise this can completely just deteriorate into, into one of the most insane seasons we've ever seen i mean we had was it in serie b where the Juventus-owned player, 
his dad ran onto the pitch. Serie Chi. Serie Chi. Sorry. Who jumped is he owned by Juventus, that guy? Yeah, he's, he's, owned, he's, he's Is it Spendi? Yeah, Spendi. Yeah, Spendi. Yeah, Spendi. He's, he's Spendi. owned by, by Juve. His dad ran onto the pitch. And that was, that was hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, mm. it doesn't get much more Serie ass than that. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was superb. That was superb. <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, I've seen that in Bedford lots of times. Like, <laughs> yeah. You should have seen our teams. I mean, my, my, my dad ran onto the pitch a, a few of times. Of course he uh, did. He never struck the referee. <laughs> He never struck the referee, referee. punched the opponent player. Like yeah. this is another level of, I mean, it's just you no know, Italian, like Italian football for drama and mad madness. I once had, I once had a, a parent throw water over me, uh, like <laughs> uh, during a game because I, I, I fouled his son. And then at half time, it was freezing cold. The temperature was like minus one, <laughs> minus two, and and he come over and he threw threw like a whole jug of water over me, like the half time water okay. that's the closest i've ever come Jesus to Christ. yeah oh dear anyway uh, rest yeah. of rest of serie a results so frosinone two monza three talking of youngsters yeah. i really like carboni at yeah. monza i really really like him he's got something about him he really has he's got that little that little spark yeah he's got that little spark about him that little Under burst of acceleration moon about how well he's doing um mm. Really the only good. question with him is kind of does he fit into Inzaghi's system, I guess, isn't it? Like, I just don't think he does because he's more of a what more of an attacking midfielder. Yeah, he's more of a number well ten. Have to, yeah, and and I just don't see he's how... kind of in that he's in between the gap, isn't he? Between he's <laughs> yeah. in between the midfield and the attack, he's like a Trecortista, but cent- more central kind of, and he's not yeah. really a centre forward, and he's not a centre midfielder. Like I don't, I don't, I think that's the that's the issue with him. But I really like him. I liked him like when he came on against Juventus and he scored that goal. Okay, it was a fluke, but he was, you know, he's got a lovely left foot. He, I, I really like him. I no, really I like, like him, him too. He's, he, there, there is a, there is a very interesting player there. Um, yeah. So there are youngsters. You see, there are youngsters in Serie A coming through. Yeah, there are. There really are. Um, it's just they're, they're not being played at Inter, but you know, Juventus have changed and and and, and you know, obviously setting new records. But Milan, I think, are the furthest down this road. And you see that with, with all the players that they brought on and bring on and they play and they score and and you know Traore is, is the latest one. Yeah. Jan Carlos Simic another. I mean you just you know we we're barely getting to learn the names of all these young and that, and the and the, the young Spaniard as well. I really like the looks of him yes, as well. I really like Jimenez, Jimenez. Jimenez and yeah, Jimenez, yeah I really like him. Yeah. He looks. He looks yeah, he really was called. A, he was called a piccolo Teo by. Uh, it might have been by Teo Hernandez. We called him, yeah. which means little Teo. Yeah, um, yeah. It might not have been Teo Hernandez. Somebody, one of the Milan players, called him that yeah. anyway. And uh, yeah, I really, I really like the looks. I've only seen a bit of him, but he, he, he's looked really good as well. So Milan have. Yeah, there is. There's. That's good, and that's where hopefully with the with the um, you know the, the the growth decree that maybe that hopefully that can be a positive that we can develop mm. more more youngsters. I and mean, we had a whole debate on that last week, yeah. but. Yeah, it's, it is a that is something that is refreshing to see that these players mm. are starting to get a few more chances. Even Allegri, like yeah, he brought on at one one, he brought Nonje non, on for uh, who's yeah. another really talented youngster uh, who yeah. I've seen a bit in the in the youth team who I who I really really like as well. Um, he's got yeah. big talent. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah, and the other game was Lecce Cagliari, which ended one 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 one. Yeah, so this is very tight. What, you're telling me you didn't watch it? How dare oh. you not? How dare you not watch Cagliari, <laughs> Lecce Cagliari at the Via del Mare in in the pouring rain? It was it was a wonderful game, and <laughs> and it's um and it is um and it ended and of course it ended in a draw and and now you you look at I mean leaving all the Juve Inter nonsense aside, if Salernitana had won that game, then. The the, the 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 relegation race would have been so spicy because mm. they would have had 15 points. Yeah. Empoli would have been last with 13, Verona 14, then Cagliari, Salernitana 15. But now, you know, it's it's uh, five points between Udinese in 16th and Salernitana in 20th. And obviously with with the Sassuolo uh, winning and despite Frosinone losing, it's starting to, uh, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of a gap, which which breaks my heart because I wanted to have a 16. Well, I think that Frosinone <laughs> are really plummeting at the moment. Yeah. They've, they've got one point in their last six games. And I mean, I don't want to say questions need to be asked to Di Francesco, but, you know, another... Question needs another, to be asked. Yeah, because it needs to be asked. For this. <laughs> well, yeah, they. I mean, which is, I mean, they've been, they've been so good, and then and and then they only beat Thrash Napoli a couple of weeks ago, but that was in the cup, you know. Yeah. So they they and they got Juventus in the cup this week and 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 in midweek, and and you know, so 
Frosinone have got to really start looking over their shoulders because they're the kind of team and Di Francesco's the kind of coach who's probably not a coach that likes to fight. No. They like it when it's all going well and it's all fancy and, you know, but when the going gets tough, when you I have to know. grind out results, yeah. I don't trust him to do that. And they do play Cagliari at home and Verona away over the next couple of rounds, which is, I mean, I don't even think I need to tell anyone how important that will be for the for the relegation scrap. And mm. no, it's, it's uh, these, these relegation scraps are coming a little bit too early for my taste. I love them when they occur in May, April, May, when mm. it really matters and, and the sun is shining and, and the Italians go full on mad and, mm. and, it's, and, and you have angry presidents like uh, Benevento president Vigorito, who it's one of the greatest rant post match rants of all time. I remember I was cry laughing uh, when I was watching it, and and I remember tweeting about it, and Gab Marcotti responded to me saying he said he felt like he was watching Italian TV from the early eighties <laughs> when he was talking about that rant. And if someone is, can see it, just go on YouTube and look for Vigorito. I think his name, yeah, and and and, and <laughs> check, check that. Like, it, it's gold. Um, but yeah, no. Usually the, the relegation scraps when it, when there's April May is, is is when they're at their best. So I'm a little bit upset with the calendar that they're having them so early on. Um, but you know they're they're enjoyable and and Cagliari are right there and it's this is going to be this is going to be a dogfight hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Um, right, okay. Let's finish off with Baggio, Premface, and Serie Ass of the week. Baggio. Badjo of the week. Who have we got for Badjo? Um, I think there was. Um, I can't remember who was it who did a. I saw a lovely little nutmeg, um, which which I uh, I forgot to jot down who it was who did it, but it was. Um, I think it was in the. I think it was in the Napoli game. Uh, I think I think it was Illich who nutmeg Juan Jesus. Mm. Uh, and it was absolutely beautiful. I can't remember, but that that was that was one of those pretty ones. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I I would have liked to have gone Yildiz if he'd have played well, but he didn't play very well against the mm. Italian because in the midweek Coppa Italia game he scored an amazing goal. Well, Timothy Vea and, and well. Waya scored an amazing yeah. goal so as they, well. They, 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 one of them can be the badge of the week because it is the last week, isn't it? So okay, oh, let's let's go let's go for Waya then because we're, we're we're always accused of, of being uh, not being nice to some of the American players and so yeah, let's, can, let's uh, go with Tim Waya. It was an unbelievable goal. I mean, it was, it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, his dad would have been uh, would have been proud of that. That's for sure. Right, prem face of the week. I've, I've got I've got some some fantastic ones. Fantastic. Yeah, you ones. do. You take it away. They are they are delicious. Yeah. So the first one we've got uh, Andy Goldstein, who is a, a DJ a presenter on on Talk Sport. Of and you wouldn't be surprised to know it's talks for it. And he said when Luke Littler was in the semi-final, just qualified for the semi-final of the World Darts Championship, Can we... this Luke Littler is a 16-year-old who was playing in his first ever darts championship. And he, he, he was doing fantastically well in the early rounds of the tournament. And he was qualified for the semi-final after beating a former world champion, Raymond Van Barneveld, a Dutch Dutch guy. And everybody's going mad of him, obviously, because he's 16 years old and he's this wonder kid. And Andy Goldstein comes on to talk sport and he says that that Luke Littler is the greatest young sportsman of all time. <laughs> uh, better, and he used the word, <laughs> better than Pele. Better than Pele, who obviously won the World Cup at seventeen, at seventeen as scoring a star. in the World Cup final, yeah, scoring twice in the World Cup final, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah, so that's what that's what Andy Goldstein said. And Luke Littler didn't even end up winning the tournament; he lost in the he lost in the final. Um, but you know, I, I think I think that listen, I want to say one thing. I don't want to make fun of a sixteen-year-old; he's sixteen and everything. But he is that's what I was he's, he's an amazing player. Like, I like darts; I actually enjoyed darts. You know, that, that's one of my kind it's, of. But here's what I wanted to say: one of my it's, it's not a sport; it's a hobby and an. Activity. No, no, it's throwing things at a wall, but it's fun, you know. <laughs> throwing shit at a wall, but it's it's fun, you know. It's, no, there's it's... skill involved. I think you're being a little bit too harsh. There, no, no, there is skill. In, there is skill there's involved. lots of skill yeah. involved. No. Come on, you, there is lots of skill involved. There's not. A, I mean, I I, I no. give them all of that, but it's not a sport. No, it's you, not. If you have a beer belly, 
that big and you're good at it at well this he's got a beer's belly at 16 i mean he I doesn't look 16 he looks older than me i mean you should see his hairline yeah, i've seen it he's, i mean <laughs> i mean but, he's so, bit, I, i'm not taking away that there is skill involved absolutely not and i do think it is a difficult you know but it's not a sport it's no not it's not a sport you can't call him a sportsman I mean, call him a, <laughs> i'm sorry but if nah come on let, let's be serious it's not yeah. a sport I, it's, again i'll say again i like darts I, I like watching it i used to have a darts board actually uh, at yeah. home me and, too. It's fun. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good game. It's a yeah, it's activity. A, yeah. It's a drinking activity. Um, yeah. it, I'm sorry, but it is. And when when something is a drinking, and this activity, guy is honestly, genuinely, this guy's amazing. He's going to win loads of world championships. He's 16 yeah, years he's old. Like, he's he's, he's, he's old. a phenomenon. He's absolutely yeah. incredible. He's got a great temperament. I've seen his interviews, and and you know he's he's. I'm sure he's really he's professional. Great. I'm sure he's but, super. But talented. I mean, not the, meaning him. But this is what I'm talking about. Oh. The, pr- the premature. Even if you classify him as a sportsman, which you shouldn't, like you said. It's this premature, uh, the greatest young sport of all all time. Exactly when he's just qualified for the <laughs> semi final. time he's got to the semi finals of the World Darts Championship, and that Boris makes Becker him... won Wimbledon at seventeen. Yeah, I mean it's just like you know uh, that just came to me. There's just so much like there's been uh, tennis players who've won Grand Slams at sixteen, or maybe yeah, even younger. I mean, yeah, women's players like it's like oh God, stop. Mm-hmm. My, I, it gives me a migraine. Like they all, this this greatest of all time fetish, mental hang up that they've got. This notion of he's the greatest of all time. Like it's, <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> Stop it. Like oh Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. I love how you do the Martin Samuel accent there. <laughs> just, <laughs> well, he, he is my go to <laughs> prem face now. Yeah. But so 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 you know he, he just everything about him is mm. right. This yeah. one is this one is fantastic as well. So BBC. There was a quiz show on TV on I think it was Saturday. But was where, it a joke? I have wanted no, to no, ask. No, 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 no. It wasn't. It was. It was. It was. It was real. It was real. Um, it was. There's a quiz show on 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 TV. A uh, serious quiz show on 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 BBC BBC TV BBC One I think it was, and uh, all the it was kind of like a not a celebrity but sort of a celebrity quiz show. Uh, all the all the uh, the guests were all uh, contestants were all BBC radio presenters and the question was which tennis player named Andre won all four tennis grand slams and the olympics in the 1990s and the the the, uh, girl, the, the, the radio presenter BBC radio presenter her name was Vicky Hawksworth her <laughs> answer was Andre the giant <laughs> 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 was she serious? Because I've not. No, seen she was before. serious. Yes, she was absolutely. Did the serious. others laugh? Yes, they did. Good, because that if that's a serious answer, it's embarrassing, and if it's a joke, it's actually quite witty. It's actually quite a good joke. Yeah. It's actually a good joke. If it's a joke, it's a really good joke. I think it's funny because it's a '90s pop culture reference. But yeah, but if it's serious, it's oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Superb, yeah. So that was that was the other prem face of the week. The third one. Do you want to take this? This third one? one, because I I feel like I can't bring myself. No, to you do have it. to do it. I can't this, bring this, myself this, to do it. I'll put the link in. It. It. Please do it. Well, I can't. You have to do I can't. it. I can't. You have to do it because Italians Italians angry at food is my is is the greatest thing I know. <laughs> so you have to do it. You, you have to be as offended as I know you are. Like just 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 tell the story, Carlo. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so a story that's gone viral all around the world is um, one of the, the, the greatest pizza makers in the whole world, Gino Sorbillo, who's a legend, yeah, absolute legend. Um, and he he made a pineapple pizza in, in, in Italy, added it to his menu, and it's, it's caused absolute uproar. <laughs> the <laughs> Neapolitans are so angry. Yeah, they've gone absolutely berserk about it. Like They disowned him. <laughs> They've disowned, they've disowned him. It's gone. They've gone absolutely ballistic, and um, it's it's gone viral all around the world. It's it's on all the all the newspapers. They've been discussed. It's become like a. It's become like one of the biggest talking points on Italian TV. It's like yeah. all over the news. It's They're it's so become angry. like prime time. You know, <laughs> prime time debate on all the talk shows. It's, they are angry. Really angry. I'm angry as well. Well, he shouldn't be because he's not put tomato on it, which I think is the biggest problem with mm. with putting pineapple on pizza. Is I don't think it works well with a tomato. One is savory, one is sweet, and 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 pineapple is such a very special fruit anyway. But he's he's he hit it on a on a, on a pizza bianca. Yeah, it's a pizza bianca. bianca. It's not a yeah. 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 So 
I would say, okay, I'd actually try that. And I think, you know, God. probably I'd try it. God, but... last week, pasta and chicken from, 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 from <laughs> Nima. This week, uh, this week, pizza. <laughs> pizza con, uh, con, uh, yeah, ananas, con, con, say. con, yeah, con, uh, what, what is it? I can't remember. Ananas. That. Ananas. Is, anana, is it? Yeah, ananas. Ananas. Okay. Yeah, that's the same the same in Sweden then. It's the same word. Um but yeah, no, the pineapple uh, but I mean as long as the tomato's not on that. But that, that's my biggest gripe because I think that just it just ugh, that, that, that it just they just don't go together. Something that's mm. as savory and 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 you know with, with that kind of flavor with, with no, it just doesn't work. Um mm. But yeah, no, but this is funny. Italians angry at food is, is the best thing in the world. Uh, one of our patrons, Sean, sent me an Instagram post. There's this American girl who tortures her Italian boyfriend and and films him while she does it by, by going up. With I think I've seen this. I think I've seen this. I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've seen this. Food suggestions for mm. the evening. And he gets objectively and genuinely of personally offended yeah i've seen it but i think it's i think that is i think it's a little bit put on i think it's a, i think it's i think it's staged quite a lot of that but yeah yeah but the lasagna lasagna soup thing i mm. i i couldn't stop laughing he was so pissed off he was genuinely personally offended and it was very, very, very funny. And she, she was like giggling. She couldn't contain her laughter. And, and, and there is something unbelievably funny with Italians angry at food because <laughs> it's, it's a personal offense and no one else in the world takes food as a personal offense <laughs> like that. And it's very, very amusing. Um, so, so that's why, you know, it's, it, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Seria <sighs> ass of the week. We've got a few here as well. For me, well, Spendi dad, the, the Spendi's dad running into the pitch and mm. punching the oppos- opposition player is, is just, the, that, that can't happen. Well, I wouldn't have that as Serias, because I think that's just hilarious. I think that's brilliant. I, I, think, it is, it is I, mean, I think Serias is more when you do something that really just... <laughs> it's you know, embarrassing like to have own goal. Dad. Yeah, yeah, but the, the dad of a player rushing onto the pitch in, the, in professional football. What about? Do you remember that? What, what about that pre, that president that, that went on with his um, with a gun? No, with a no, gun. With the, with the, no, no, with his, no, no, that was Greece. Sorry, oh. uh, that was the Greek. <laughs> who went suit. on with a gun? I don't know this word. Who went yeah, on? This, it was the Pauk president who got angry at the referee and had a pistol. On in, in in a holster and ran onto the pitch in a holster in, in, in the holster like you got you know you what got is like, this like the world west like, or something exactly like it literally it was one of the most bizarre images I've ever seen but that was Greece and that was their top flight but Greek football I mean it's it's just mental in it Greek, I mean Mediterranean is just mad but but it's um but no no the, no I know which one you mean the guy with the with the, with the rascal scooter the scooter so, that's it because yeah. <laughs> he was pissed it just off went across it. the pitch isn't it yeah because whenever angry, I see and, that it reminds me of it reminds me of the when i played when i was a kid and one of the dads of, of, the, of the kids just just decided to walk across the pitch during the middle <laughs> during the middle of a match to get over to the other side and the ref the, everyone was the ref was like what are you doing he goes i need to get to the other side it's like why did you just walk around the pitch yeah, but this was a protest though. he was protesting the referee well, i mean last season the ternana president and the spitting with with the fans and, and the shit show that was there was just and, and answering answer in the middle of the press conference and having a conversation with <laughs> with the with the press agency while in the middle of the press conference that is, oh, God. That, that is serious but so, no so, the, so where were we i, I can't remember where yeah, we are you, but i gotta say that the tejan buchanan not the video but the announcement short with with the pancakes and the maple syrup i cringed so bad i i thought my teeth were gonna fall out and it's like of all the Canadian stereotype jokes that you could have gone with, going with maple syrup, and he's sitting there, you know, because all Canadians are really well mannered and polite, and he's sitting there, and you can see that he's dying a little bit inside, but he doesn't want to say anything, and he's so polite, and he pours the the, the maple syrup on the pancakes, and some, oh, I just, mm. at least it wasn't syrup on spaghetti like our friend Rishi Sunak. <laughs> <laughs> talking of food you, what is that about i still don't understand what he was doing I, I no understand. i don't know but we did have we did have somebody uh, i think it was sabrina our, our patron sabrina oh. uh, said that she thinks he was doing a reenactment of the movie elf 
which I'm sure I've watched, oh. but but I, I, I haven't a message. seen it, yeah, haven't seen message, it for so long. I haven't seen it either. And we got a message about for, about that from, from one of our other Pedro's, Mark Moriale, who said the mm. same thing, actually, now that you mention oh. it. So we, can we let off Rishi then? Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Because okay. <laughs> <That's laughs> yeah, I, I just didn't understand what he was doing. Mm. Maybe yeah, it was Will Ferrell and Elf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough. Okay. Okay. But yeah, the the, the Tejon Buchanan announcement clip, um, and yeah, I've got two yeah. more. I've got two more. Cool. One was there was a post by the Serie A Twitter account of a squirrel on the out running around the, the, the outside of the pitch, and the the Serie oh, the, the Serie A captioned it with. Uh, excuse me, sir. Where is your ticket? <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> Just, oh, like, my who writes God. these jokes? Nineteen eighty-six just called and wants their TV comics back. <laughs> oh my days! Yeah, oh, I love it. I love it. On a, on a more serious note, now just to just to just to finish off. There was, uh, this isn't confirmed, this isn't official, but there was a, a report that came out in the Italian media that Italy will play their two next international matches in the, the March international break. So this is the last international break before Luciano Spalletti will choose his squad um, for, for, for Euro 2024. It's really, really important international break. Italy will play two games and Spalletti has been absolutely crystal clear that he wants Italy to play against two top level opponents because he need they need to be tested. He needs to see which players are up to the level, which players are not, in order to pick his squad. It's really, really important. It also comes, of course, during a very, very busy part of the season. It comes in between the, the Champions League last sixteen and quarter finals, which we hope, of course, our teams can can will, will still be will still be in. Um, and also it comes during a point where, you know, we've got a real title race here. It's going to be a very, very busy part of the season. So what does the, what does the, the Italy national team do? Well, they organise, the Federation organises for them to play two games in the United States against Peru in Miami and against Ecuador in Philadelphia. This isn't confirmed yet, um, but this would be the first time in 19 years that the Italy national team will play in the United States and it's pretty clear what this is all about it's just more of this North American marketing which is literally the only thing that that is they just the only thing that that the the, the, the Serie A and the Lega and the FIGC it's all they're doing just market everything in North America just do America 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 it's going to solve all our problems the Americans are going to save us and everything's <laughs> going to be great and it just drives me mad. It drives me mad. Peru and Ecuador, you know, it drives me absolute mad. And we, we're going on a transatlantic flight in a really busy part of the season. It's just absolute madness. I mean, I think it's lovely. But don't get me wrong. I think it's lovely that we're playing in America. We should be playing games in America. You know, the, the North America, Canada, United States, you know, we support, you know, there's a lot of Italian Americans and uh, Italian Canadians, and they support the the national team, and they're very passionate, and it's great, and they should get the chance to watch their team. And, you know, it's fantastic. But Spalletti was really clear, and it's clear to anyone: we needed to be playing against two top level opponents, and we should not be travelling all the way to the United States at this time of the year. Um, it, it's just we know why they're doing it. It's just for marketing, and we know that this marketing doesn't work. It's just, it's just. It's just it just drives me mad. Yeah, no, it's I've got nothing more to add, and it's really really silly, to be honest. It's it's really really silly. It's um, but it is what it is. I mean, may, you know, we don't know the full story. Maybe they tried and they couldn't get anyone and whatnot. But yeah, it is what it is. No, they couldn't get any. They couldn't get better opponents than Peru and Ecuador. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I would have it would have been nice for them to play. I would say. Uh, Argentina or or someone like that. It would have been cool to see them. It would have been nice to see them play against somebody that's similar to the teams in their group. You know, if they wanted to go that route, you know, instead of playing Croatia, maybe play Serbia. Or instead of playing, uh, you know, they've got Serbia because they've got Croatia in their group. They've got Spain in their group, maybe play Portugal or someone that plays similar to, to, to Spain. But play one of the bigger teams, you know, one of the bigger teams in, or just play one of the heavyweights. Play you know, play France or play Germany or play... Do you know what I mean? This is what Spalletti wants. This is the only way we're going to know if some of these players are good enough is by, by playing against these teams, seeing how they how they do, you know? Scalvini, for example, someone like Scalvini, for example, or 
or Bon or, or you know, we need a centre back. You know, we need to test out our centre backs. You know, or well, Scalvini had an absolute shocker against England in the in the one big against the one big team that he played. Can you possibly trust playing Scalvini now, knowing that he's not going to play against the big team until until the squad's chosen in the Euros? I mean, uh, you know, and, you, and the sim the same for for a lot of other kind of still unproven players. You know, same with centre midfield. We're a bit short on centre mids because of because of suspensions and and and, and absentees. Well. You know, we need to test out some of our midfielders against the best midfielders and the best teams. I mean, it's just, um, yeah, it's, it, 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 this is where we shoot ourselves in the foot all the time, all the time. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I, I would have liked that as well. But I mean, we'll see what happens. And and I'm sure that those eight days in Florida and Philadelphia will <laughs> we'll, well, see. I can tell you what's going to happen. All the Inter players and Juventus players are going to pull out. That's that's the number one. <laughs> exactly. All the, So they're not they're not going to play. <laughs> and uh, and then the, the other players, or Mourinho will, will will tell his players to to take it easy because they've got they've got Europa League games coming up, uh, and you know so it's just it's just <laughs> it's just mad. It's absolutely mad. If there's a title race, then there is no no chance that in, that Marotta or Juntoli are letting any players. No chance at all. No <laughs> chance. <laughs> Uh, for a silly friendlies in, in the United States. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, or anywhere. It could be in Australia. It doesn't matter. In, uh, no, it's, 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 they should have stayed at home and they should have, uh, like you said, tried to bring someone over and, and played someone, you know, play Argentina or Brazil in, in in Rome or something like that. I mean, if you want to, you want to have that, but, you know, just go into the for, for, uh, nonsense. But we'll see. Hopefully it, 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 it helps Paletti somewhat at least. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's leave it at that then. Um, we... We'll be back on Wednesday for a. Oh, sorry. We're back on Thursday or Wednesday. We're doing a Q and A this week because last week I was very ill, so it's my fault that we didn't publish the usual content. Uh, I was very, very out with man flu, and it's been lingering on, and that's <clears throat> why I'm a little bit congested and and still snivelling. So I'd like to apologise for that. But this week we'll be doing a Q and A this week uh, on on uh, on Wednesday or Thursday, and then next week we'll be back with a regular programming. Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and try to do a transfer and, and focus on the transfer market as well. Yeah, yeah, we will do. Okay, right. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you later in the week. Until then, ciao, ciao.